yesterday is everyone please do take the time to, as you complete a session, remember to open up that session, click on the star icon on the far left and rate that session very quickly. Um, this is a way to just get real-time data on how our sessions are moving. We tabulate the data and look at it each evening. Um, but again, your feedback is really important to us as we evolve the summit. And then finally, and most importantly, um, the trivia challenge from last night. So just a little bit of a tease. The prizes will be assembled here in the next few hours. They are pretty fantastic. Um, we will share the winning team at lunchtime with their winning picture. Um, so get very excited for that as well. And if you have any questions about that, obviously let us know. And again, is by chance McKenna Be Bajan in the room? McKenna? McKenna's in the back. If you have any questions about um, the photos and or any questions about the application and what we're saying with Convene, please let us know. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Michael to kick us off this morning. Again, welcome and good morning. Perfect. OK. So good morning, everyone. And hopefully everyone got a decent night's sleep because we're really going into the, uh, to the meat, to the heart of uh, the summit in the next couple of days. And um, hope you all have a time to enjoy uh, and learn uh, from your colleagues and uh, from this amazing city. Um, a couple of housekeeping items on our side as well. So we loved, we were inspired by all of your energy yesterday. We thought yesterday went really well. Um, we're cautious about um, how tightly packed this agenda is. I mean, we flew everybody in. Everybody flew themselves in uh, from all over the world. And so part of our um, uh, imperative was to try to make the most of it. We took many, many of our staff so we could have meetings with you, so you guys could meet each other, so you could meet platform partners, which is coming up. Um, but as a consequence of that tightly packed agenda, we sort of ran over a little bit yesterday. So we, we, we heard that as a criticism. We're going to try to be more punctual and on time today. Um, and if also, just make sure that during the sessions you're fully here. I know you all have busy cities to go back to. Um, but uh, make sure that you're, you're totally present with your, your colleagues, and we'll, and we'll try to uh, make the most of this time together. Um, this talk, uh, I, I'm, 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 I'm going to do two talks this week. One today, which is really about what we're seeing out there in the world, what we're inspired by, what are the key challenges that we continue to see. Um, and then the talk on Friday is much more about the organization, about 100RC, about the movement that we are collectively trying to, um, uh, to conjure up, to the revolution we're trying to spark. Um, and so it will be much more about um, all of that kind of blocking and tackling. Today is really uh, more about the substance, about resilience, about the state of urban resilience. Um, and so when we think about what the state of urban resilience is, we looked at 2015. Um, and we, we saw, you know, month after month, week after week, 2015 reminded us that we need resilience now more than ever. In January, we had the attacks in Paris uh, in Charlie Hebdo. Uh, 11 people were killed, another 11 were injured. But I think what was more interesting from a resilience standpoint was it sparked a national conversation about what it means to be French, what it means to pr be Parisian, really how we integrate new, in, um, new immigrants into the system. Can someone help me uh, turn this off? Can someone help me turn this off? <laughs> this is a little too much redundancy. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's an important quality of the resilience framework, but, uh, uh, you know, it's, oh. They're both off? Okay, okay, super, super. Thank you, which is gracious. So in February, uh, we saw massive snowstorms throughout, um, in fact, throughout the winter, throughout the entire northeast of the United States, but in particular, 
Um, Boston saw a record. We, they, they saw 65 inches of snow in February alone, the most snow that the, uh, in one month that the city had gotten since records began to be kept in uh, 1872. And this not only paralyzed the region, shut down transportation, but also had an impact on the city's most poor and vulnerable. In March, massive blackout um, in Turkey, uh, 14 million inhabitants totally paralyzed the system. We saw in April uh, the earthquake in Nepal, over 9,000 people killed, more than 23,000 people injured. And really, the story of Kathmandu is, is, is one of urban expansion run away. Um, massive urban expansion over the last two or three decades, poor housing standards, uh, 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 dis dysfunctional government, um, and, and this in and, and an incredibly vulnerable seismic area, as we saw so tragically in April. In May, back in the US, we saw the riots related to the police killing of Freddie Gray. And uh, at one level, this is about police tactics and police brutality. But when you unpack what was really happening in Baltimore, you know, since 1950, when the city was at a million, it lost 40% of its population, down to about 600,000. You saw jobs leave, the industrial base almost, almost completely vanished in Baltimore, um, property values down. If you look at the neighborhood uh, that Freddie Gray, the, the victim in this case, that he lived in, 42% of the adults in that neighborhood are employed. Um, so massively high unemployment, and it looks at really reminds us what the interplay between shocks and stresses does um, to a city. Uh, in June, uh, floods in Accra, Ghana, uh, and this is the mangled cars, uh, killed two, over 250 people. I was actually there uh, during this, this floods. Um, massive amounts of rain. Uh, about 100 of those people were killed when a gas station exploded. So people had gone into, under a gas station, which was on a slightly higher ground, and covered to take shelter, and then a spark ignited the petrol tanks, and, and it blew up and tragically killed 100 people. But another 150 people in that city died because water swept through their homes while they were sleeping, um, while they are in bed, and so on. So uh, it's, a, it's an issue that Accra, and you know that Accra is one of our, our cities, and we really love the mayor. He hasn't yet appointed a, a CRO, uh, but one of the, the real issues that, that Accra um, uh, continues to struggle with. What I'm not talking about here is uh, what follows is the outbreak of cholera and disease and all the things that we see after uh, we see flooding. In July, Athens, um, uh, more riots. I think this uh, looks like a shock because we're showing a picture and we're giving a date, but it's really much more of a protracted stress um, uh, in terms of austerity, the financial condition uh, that our, our colleagues in Greece and particularly in Athens um, are, are dealing with. Um, in August, and this is another, you know, we could have put this in July, August, September, uh, really the region even now continues to struggle with uh, the haze and the air pollution, um, incredibly high levels uh, of pollution uh, due to fires in the region affecting Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, Thailand, Vietnam, Cambodia, and the Philippines, a real uh, regional, um, you know, is this a shock or a stress? Maybe it doesn't matter. Um, a, a real regional resilience challenge. Um, and uh, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about budget in a bit, but uh, an interesting stat here was that the Singaporean government estimates that regional losses uh, from the haze are close to a billion dollars per week. So that's, now that's a Singaporean government estimate, but a, a regional, uh, regional dollar amount. But when you talk about what the uh, the impact is in trying to quantify the impact of these resilience challenges. Uh, you can see this. Um, in September, again, another uh, really longer term, slower burn um, resilience challenge coming to the fore. Uh, you saw the migrants um, uh, uh, across uh, the region. This, I think, really hit the international media. I know our colleagues uh, throughout Europe were much more aware of this, even sooner in Europe and the Middle East. Were we're much more aware of this even sooner, but in, in, in September, this really uh, came to the fore. And I want to just introduce uh, Peter Madonia, who has been thinking a lot about how um, uh, the COO at, at, at Rockefeller uh, and one of our, our, our founding fathers, really. And if you haven't met him, please 
um, uh, uh, do so over the next day, um, but has been thinking a lot about how cities can um, uh, integrate and, and use uh, migrants as a, 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 as a, not use, but um, see and view migrants as a resource and not as just a burden. And what, what are the things that needs to happen? I think this might be, you know, in our uh, verbiage, this is a shock because it's an immediate situation that cities, Amman, Byblos, Athens, to some degree Thessaloniki, um, uh, uh, Rome, uh, and so on, have to deal with now, but if, if, if uh, in, migrants aren't integrated in the right ways, um, they will become a long-term stress for cities. And if they are integrated in the right ways, migrants become a real asset. So um, uh, Sebastian and I have talked a lot about that in the, in the Paris context as well, so uh, another great resource that we're thinking about how cities integrate migrants. The one other thing I would say is we talked a lot about this with the mayors in Bellagio, the mayors who came. Uh, and, to, and leading up to Bellagio, we, we did some research about where were the best practices for cities integrating um, migrants. And there's not a ton of best practice thought out there. It's much more related to the camps, how we put them in camps, how we uh, care for them in camps, how we either send them back or integrate them in other ways. But where is the city relevant best practice for how we integrate migrants, I think, is something um, that maybe we as a collective community can continue to inter inter integrate and innovate on. Um, lastly, uh, taking us almost up to the present, the flooding in Porto Alegre, um, uh, and, and, and Cesar and Patrick, wherever he is, uh, can, uh, can, can talk much more about this, but 32 millimeters of rain over a 24-hour period um, and you saw uh, massive um, and, uh, and pronounced flooding. So I think, um, you know, we saw, uh, you know, in 2015, all of these accumulated shocks and stresses. And we can expect, without being harbingers of doom and gloom, that this trend is going to continue, that the need for resilience, the urgency of that, um, really continues. And so um, what, I, what I didn't put up a picture of, but in November, uh, Amman, Jordan has had some very serious flooding um, of its own. This is uh, Amman, the beautiful city on a nice uh, sunnier day. Um, but it really gives you a sense of, um, you know, th th that the urgency is, is still there, the need to build urban resilience. And when Rockefeller, and, and here I'm, I'm looking at Patrick uh, Brennan and, and Peter Madonia, when, when they thought about what the reasons for 100 resilient cities, why launch this initiative, it was about three sort of global macro trends. It was about globalization, urbanization, and climate change, um, and, the, and, the, and, and really the intersection of that. And that was the original rationale, and, and, we, can, and, we, and we certainly can continue to see that rationale play out in cities all over the world. We collectively have begun to expand that logic, that, those issues, that point of view um, in meaningful ways. But you know, cities are really both our greatest risk we have, as you know, more than 50% of the world's population living in cities. Um, and they, um, you know, but they're also our, our, our possibly our greatest asset. Annual economic output of cities, 62 trillion. It's about 85% of global GDP. Um, and on the other hand, you know, we see 60% of global energy consumption, 70% of global greenhouse gases. Um, you see the, uh, the intersection of Im you know, immigrants, migrants, um, living in the most vulnerable areas, all of those continue to be uh, really important factors um, and, and what we're seeing out as, as we visit your cities all around the world. So what I'd like to do now is talk a little bit about three big trends that we, um, we're seeing, and then I'll talk a little bit about some emerging uh, solutions. So people are on the move at the largest scale in human history. And this is either a push or a pull. And in the refugee crisis that we've just talked about, the, it's largely a push. People have been pushed out of Syria, other war-torn areas, and they're, they're making their way to more stable cities in the Middle East uh, and to Europe. And 
um, uh, and also to uh, places in the U.S. and, 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 and beyond. Uh, so, you know, we're seeing, you know, 59.5 million people displaced by, from their homes um, by the end of uh, 2014 compared to 51.2 million in 2013 and 37.5 million in 2012. So you can see this massive upward graph. On the other side, we, are ha we also have cities in this room who are dealing with the pull. So uh, I don't know where Victoria Salinas is, for instance, but <laughs> uh, that Oakland, California, um, is really, and, and many of our, 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 our urbanizing, gentrifying cities are, are dealing with this pull of, of citizenry as well. I think you know, New Orleans is also a, an example of that, um, how, how, how citizens are actually coming there, and how can we integrate that citizenry uh, in a way uh, that uh, helps drive uh, our city, drive economic growth, and yet doesn't displace or, or dislocate the citizens who are there. And so trying to have that conversation, I think, is really meaningful. I haven't seen best practice on that kind of integration yet, and I'm still on the, on the hunt for it. So if anyone out there has seen cities who have really done that well, uh, I, I, we would love to um, dive further into that and, and understand what lessons can be learned and share that back out with you. Because as your cities get better, you will draw people and you will um, be faced with um, uh, gentrification issues and displacement on that side. So we're seeing both the push and the pull in terms of people on the move. Uh, the second is that water continues to be the top risk. So one of the stats we often talk about is that 85% of the almost 800 applications that came in the two rounds identified water as one of the key risks. And when we did an analysis with Swiss Re, we, 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 we found out that you all had underestimated water. <laughs> so that number should really be in the high or mid-90s. And so whether that is you know, access to potable water, it's rainfall flooding, it's storm surge, it's sea level rise, it's droughts and shortages, uh, we see water uh, being a key issue in so many of your cities. We'll see it here in Mexico City as we look at the living lab. Um, many of your PRAs, Vile, Norfolk, NOLA, uh, Ro of course Rotterdam, uh, uh, continue to see water as a absolutely a, as, a, as a key challenge. Um, and interestingly, one of the things we're seeing, and I, I think we see it somewhat here in Mexico City and in many cities around the world, is we see both too much and too little. Um, and so you see when you have damaged aquifers, when the rains come, you have nowhere for the water to go, it floods. When you have dry season, you don't have that reserve, um, and you run out of water. And so really being conscious of that uh, issue and, and innovating best practices around water. When we think about the learning communities later today, I think water may be too big a learning community. We may have to start to piece it out into the different kinds of learnings that we want to get from it, um, because I think water is just like climate change might be just too um, big of an issue. I'll also point out that water can be a real asset. So um, cities that have or are in the process of trying to secure uh, sources of potable water, I mean, one of the great um, successes of New York over the past you know, century, really, is securing amazing quality drinking water at three or four big aquifers. They just completed a third water tunnel, so they have real redundancy there. Um, but having secure um, and maintaining secure potable water is a real asset for a city. I don't think I need to make that point anymore, but that, that obviously is a long-term thinking. And one of the interesting things is it's usually outside this municipality's responsibility. It rests at the state or the national level. But as we are municipal chief resilience officers, being able to be involved in that conversation I think is really, really important. The other thing that we're seeing, interestingly, is that um, uh, seeing water resilience as an economic development play. So we all know that Rotterdam and the Dutch uh, are, are the sort of masters of water. They're seeing them, they see themselves actively exporting their expertise um, uh, on that, and I think that's amazing. Uh, but we're also seeing some other cities do it as well. So both New Orleans and Norfolk aspire to using water resilience to turning their vulnerabilities in water into an asset um, is a really interesting way to begin to think about it. And so I think as we 
um, uh, as, as we think about resilience and what the resilience dividend is, what co-benefits might be, um, thinking about water resilience as an important play is, is, is going to be an interesting way to look at things. Um, and then uh, the last sort of mega trend, I talked about this last year, but I think it's worth reemphasizing, is that inequity continues to be a key resilience issue. Cities that are more equitable, I would, I would make the argument, and I think you know, we'll continue to look for ways to demonstrate this with the research, cities that are more equitable are more resilient. Um, and at some level, again, this is an issue that rests way above you. It's, you know, if you, Thomas Pinkerty and capital and the global flows of capital and how that exacerbates um, inequity down to national policies and how taxation and, and regulation can either drive um, or exacerbate uh, uh, or, or mitigate, for that matter, equity. But there are also things that cities can do to give access uh, to economic opportunities, to the poor and vulnerable, to constructing cities in a way that are connected uh, so that people can more easily access uh, those opportunities. I think as we talk today with Arnaldo about the airport, you'll see that the airport sits between basically the economic center of Mexico City and some very poor and vulnerable areas. And so one way that Mexico City might be able to might be able to address these issues um, is to, to better connect those areas with the economic center. It's something um, I think that we often talk about Medellin uh, being able to do as they did with the gondolas, escalators, and bus rapid transit connecting very hard to reach areas into an economic core. Um, so I think, you know, one thing that I've been really impressed with in terms of wave two and wave one CROs is that wave two, wave one, I would say, equity was not necessarily a part of our roundhouse. And we were more from the environmental side. I think we're, we might have more diversity as we, we start to get bigger, um, people um, thinking about equity. And I think playing in the equity space is going to be really important for us um, uh, as a community as we go forward. So that was the what in many ways. Um, and let's talk a little bit about the how. So let me just talk about three um, promising uh, approaches to confronting these challenges. And then I, I do want to open it up for questions. So I'm going to go quickly through three approaches and, and, and then stop. Um, so the first, and th we're really beginning to see the CRO, the importance of partnerships at all kinds of different levels, platform partners, local partners, international partners, how the CRO, the CRO team, how the city organizes partnerships um, and, and, and does that really matters in how a city is able to begin to identify its most pressing challenges but also address them. So just as one example um, uh, uh, to call out Norfolk and, and, and New Orleans, and many of you do this really well, I, I, I may be in some ways preaching to the choir, uh, but in, in Norfolk's most recent strategy, um, it we counted, Christine, and we counted 75 distinct partnerships that were called out at all kinds of different levels. We had anchor in local institutions like Old Dominion University. Um, we had international partnerships like the Dutch Dialogues. Um, uh, and we had local uh, stakeholders and community groups uh, like the local technology firm um, Concursive on working on the Helping Hands program. And so, I mean, really, I would encourage you to talk to Christine and, and, and some of your other colleagues about how to stitch all those partnerships together because that's one thing that we can really see. We are, um, Bryna has often talked about how she sees the CRO as, as, as a, a partnership focused. More and more we're starting to see this as a partnership role in some ways. And I think, I think that's right. It's not, this is not philanthropic partnerships. These are local technical partnerships. These are um, these are regional partners and so on, and our ability to navigate in that space um, is important and encouraging. So the second um, uh, uh, case study uh, or, or, or approach is how to unlock value uh, within already committed assets. How do you really understand the true 
costs and benefits of the, the problems that you're trying to tackle. And often, um, this is about really about the silos. Uh, you may have heard me um, talk about, in generic terms, about um, the trash gets in the streets. As, and, and this is a very common developing world story. You, the trash gets in the streets. It doesn't get picked up. The rains come. The floods happen. Disease outbreaks follow. That is a story in many, many, many of our cities all around the world. And it would be very, very easy to pick up the trash, but the, the costs and benefits of that are sprinkled across a number of different silos. And the only reason I have Rio up here again, um, is uh, because I was, uh, Luciana Neri, who's uh, the CRO in, in, in Rio, invited me to participate in their long range Rio uh, Plus 50 uh, strategic planning effort. And there, Aaron, uh, uh, Luciana, and I heard this amazing professor who has calculated down to the last half, the costs of uh, non-potable drinking water, like the, the, the cost of, of, of unclean drinking water. And he's also, and, and, and it's, you know, the costs are related to disease, hospitalizations, missed work, um, uh, cognition, because children who have chronic cholera uh, don't develop in the same ways, so you have lower cognition. Um, uh, uh, to economic development. You've seen the Olympic athletes who have gotten sick uh, sailing in the water. So all of those various costs. And then he calculated what uh, cost it would to be to fix it completely. And that payback is under 10 years. I mean, the economic argument really makes sense. This was an amazing piece of research. And yet, Rio is such a complicated, and, and Brazil is such a complicated place, as many of your cities are that the responsibility of that lies at some at the municipal level, some at the state level, lots at the national level. There are private sector. There's educational components. All of those pieces together make that a very hard um, thing to solve. But, the, but my point here is that if we're able, as CROs, to look transversely across those different silos, we will be able to unlock that value and ultimately find funding to do the projects that we need to do. Um, the third is um, this idea of correctly defining a problem uh, can unlock uh, uh, better solutions. And we're going to spend a lot of time uh, tomorrow really talking about better problem definition in the peer and partner workshops because we've seen that uh, really understanding what the root problem is uh, can, can help cities find better solutions. I, you may have heard me use this example of cities when they have dirty streets, will want to procure for more street sweepers. But if you ask the, if you start to define the problem is really what we want are cleaner streets, um, then it gets you out of the business of trying to go right to a solution and ask the question: Might that be better, more rubbish bins, uh, stricter uh, regulation and laws, more fines, better education, better street surfaces? or more street sweepers, you start to open yourself up to a much more holistic uh, possibility for what the solution is. And to give you one example of that, and this comes from our friends at City Mart, who I think will be here tomorrow, right? Um, so Nollywood, uh, the Nigerian film industry, is the world's third largest industry behind Bollywood and, and Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> So I show where my head is at right now. Uh, they, we're losing 80% of revenue to piracy. Um, and that has real impacts. It employs 100,000 people in the local area. And the impacts of that coming out of the formal economy has you know, on impacts on livelihoods of citizens, national, uh, and city budgets. And traditionally, what they've done is they've taken a real law enforcement approach to it, try to catch the pirates, suppress the piracy. Um, but when they start to say what we're really interested in is more money into the um, formal economy, um, they, they came out with some really interesting solutions. So they identified that actually the problem r was that the formal producers couldn't produce DVDs quickly enough. Uh, and so there was so much demand, and they just didn't, the, the, the traditional way of distributing the films was on DVDs. Um, and so what they did is they, they're starting to roll out advertising-supported wireless networks 
uh, that allow mo users to rent movies, so they're going to stream them as opposed to try to distribute them uh, digitally. That will drive down demand for pirated uh, DVDs. They're building movie theaters, which both start to build, you know, develop a sense of community um, where people can actually see the movies in the movie theaters. That will suppress. Um, and then, of course, there's a digital anti-piracy technological solution. So these three solutions, not a law enforcement solution, actually, once you start to ask the question, have started to make a dent. Now, it's, this, this ultimately was, this was identified first in 2011, and we're just now starting to see the results. So we don't have real results except for a little trending line. Um, but it's an example of how asking and framing the right question can help us get to better um, uh, solutions. Um, so just to close uh, uh, quickly, I mean, I think uh, we're seeing this, this moment, this moment in urban, this moment in resilience as uh, a, a, an amazing moment. And, and partly it's because of all of the catastrophe, the shocks and the stresses that I started this presentation with. Um, but uh, to give you a sense of, of, of this movement, uh, and I know you all experience it as well, um, you know, you had the first ever uh, envoy for cities, UN Special Envoy for Cities and Climate Change, uh, so you're seeing the city agenda. You're starting to see financial rating agencies like Moody's accounting for resilience. Probably everyone has heard the story, but I'll tell it just in case, um, uh, that when Moody's went to rate, so Moody, does everyone know what Moody's is? Um, when they went to uh, uh, review the ratings for the Hampton Roads area, which um, includes Norfolk, Virginia, an area that is incredibly exposed uh, to climate change, they kept it stable. Uh, and one of the things they cited was the resilience work that Christine and the team were doing there. Um, and really, depending on what that downgrade might have looked like, that has the ability to save the city you know, millions, if not billions of dollars um, uh, over over, over time. Um, and so what we're, what, you know, if we can continue this, this push, this will start to make um, uh, resilience more sustainable. Uh, we saw a, a sustainable development goal, uh, number 11 for the first time, and Deborah Roberts um, has, has, I'm sure, had her hand uh, in this a little bit, so thank you uh, for that. I think it's an important uh, uh, piece of that. Uh, uh, Paris, you, you, uh, at, at, the, at COP21, we're seeing uh, both a first ever Cities Day and a Resilience Day, so I think that whole first week at COP will be very much about um, both cities and resilience, and I think so further underscoring um, the moment that we have now. Um, and finally, Habitat 3, which is the once every 20 years conference thrown by UN Habitat. Now, this is an interesting one. It's happening, I believe, in September? September? October. October. Um, and uh, in Quito. Um, and it, it's interesting because one of the things that we see all over the world is that the more cities are able to control their own destinies, the more local authority is ceded to cities, to mayors, to regional authorities, the better the solutions are. Because mayors and cities are practical. Um, they're innovative. They're not connected often to the logjam at the national level. Um, and you see where countries have, have pushed down that authority that cities really have started to thrive. Now, the reason I raise that with Habitat 3 is the, the UN is funded by nation states. <laughs> um, and so I think it will be very interesting for all of us as we think about the future of urban resilience to look at what that dialogue looks like leading up. It would be amazing. If, ha if, if UN Habitat, in advance of Habitat 3, would, would, would suggest to nation states to cede more of that governance, more of that authority uh, into cities. And the most interesting, subversive, revolutionary idea I've heard, I don't know if it can really happen or not, but someone suggested to me recently um, uh, that uh, cities might boycott Habitat 3 in Quito in the same way that they boycotted the COP a few years ago in, where was it? The, 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 uh, the Copenhagen was the uh, anti-event. Where, where was the, where was the, anyway. So in, in that same way, might cities uh, really make a statement? I'm not sure that we have enough time or enough energy to do that. 
But what I would encourage us all um, is to look at the dynamics of what that dialogue is leading into Habitat 3. Because what would really help this collective movement is if our mayors, our governors, our local um, governance had more uh, authority uh, to make that happen. Um, so with that, oops, I have two clickers. Um, you know, I just want to thank you. You all are really at the vanguard of this, of this global uh, movement, uh, one that I hope we can collectively catalyze. Um, and I, I just want to say thank you. So thank you. <laughs> and I did OK, except for that last diatribe into Habitat. So we have about 10 minutes, maybe. Are there comments or questions or thoughts this early in the morning? We, we have a mic. Oh, no, you can't. <laughs> I think you pointed out a very important issue, which is how can we be prepared for these events and have a collective view that is produced out of this collaboration network, yeah. uh, especially for next year in Quito. I think uh, I was in Porto Alegre a month ago and I had the privilege to, to speak along Pietro Garao, who has been among the only few who, who's been in the three year now it has. And when he said to me, please encourage your colleagues to send me emails to, to identify how can we make you inhabit a tree better, yeah. I said, Jesus, he's giving me a key to directly bring our our ideas. So I think we have a responsibility there, Michael, to yeah. to produce something collectively on on behalf of one hundred RC yeah. that represents all our views and, and probably we we can meet there at, at some point as well. Yeah. I, I think one of the interesting things that we heard at the mayor summit and that we've been thinking more about recently is collective advocacy of this organization, what statements, what, whether that's at a national level, a regional level, so we're seeing a lot of interesting networking going on with EU uh, countries, how could we set this network up to more efficiently promote that in the right ways? And what the mayors talked about at Bellagio was a statement um, on the refugee crisis, for instance. It, that's a very small kind of thing because it's not binding, it's not official, but a collective, more collective voice. And we have been much more introspective <laughs> than we have been thinking about outside things. But it is definitely, as we go into 2016, thinking about what we, we totally take that point. So, um, Michael, thank you for a great summary. I, I think just uh, picking up on the point about Habitat 3 and using 100 resilient cities to advocate, in a similar way to the fact that great liberal democracies not only reflect the will of the, the, greater, good, the greater volume of population, but also protect the interests of minorities, I think it's also important that w cities don't just start to throw their weight around. Habitat is the meeting of the UN people need housing in rural areas as much as in cities. So we should be advocating for the role of cities and doing great things in cities, but we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that the world is not only urban. Yes, I think that's a great point. Uh, that, that was great, thanks, Mike. The, uh, can you give us um, your insights into the post-Sendai framework, and in particular the, the change in focus from disaster risk management to disaster risk reduction, and the four priorities around understanding risk, investing, in disaster risk reduction, strengthening governance, and being better prepared. Have you got any sort of commentary on that as a yeah. something we can influence? It's uh, we to be frank, we have largely um, we, we, we've participated, but not as a major priority in the ISDR and post Sendai framework building. Um, partly because I think we saw, I think the framework has gotten much better. 
uh, it was very DRR-y uh, with the 10 essentials before Sendai, and it's gotten a lot better. Um, and it's par partly probably the result of that pre-Sendai framework that we stayed away from it. I would also say that you know, we spend a lot of times, one of the things that seems like, and I, I would throw it out to you if this is true, in a lots of cities, it's this interplay between the shocks and the stresses. We often, our cities come to resilience with a shock focus and end up with a much more understanding their risk factors to be related to stresses. And ISDR treats that with a pretty blunt tool still, I think. And so that's probably why we haven't gotten as involved. But if it's important, I mean, I think this would be something, we don't have to solve it today, but something I would throw out to this group to consider. If this is an important alignment to have, we can try to make it happen. Um, we just haven't, with all of the opportunities, one you know, we've tried to sort through, and this is one that we've played along with when it made sense, but haven't been actively trying to influence. Uh, dear Michael, first of all, my congratulations to you. I, every time I hear you, I feel like uh, I'm in the right place because you uh, definitely try to uh, develop a thinking of uh, disruption, of uh, bringing and trying to develop a new way of uh, living in our world. So uh, that's really great. And uh, Rockefeller Foundation has a very smart uh, way to, th to think about our challenges in the world. And uh, the way we are doing things uh, in this old way is not any more sustainable. So I think you try to go in a different direction in a very precise uh, way. But I want to share with you all something that happened to me. Um, we are going to have in Porto Alegre, a reunion of the board, worldwide board of the uh, United Cities and Local Governments, uh, UCLG, is the most important uh, worldwide cities organization. And I thought it was very imp important, Michael, to give, to give a speech to that board. And I went to Barcelona because Porto Alegre was uh, hosting that reunion. And I was discussing the organization of that reunion. I said, I want uh, Michael, Rockefeller Foundation, to participate and give a speech. And I tell you, I never talked back to Michael. I have a very hard work to guarantee five minutes to Michael give a speech to the big board of the mayors of all over the world. Yeah. And you know why? Because there is a prejudice against Rockefeller Foundation. Many of these people see Rockefeller Foundation as United States imperialism, United States way of imposing something to the world in a world way of thinking because let's be clear United States have made many mistakes <laughs> in the history but <laughs> I refuse to believe that <laughs> <laughs> I see the effort Rockefeller Foundation Michael 100 resilient cities trying to go in a different way and perhaps being the vanguard of a new world we, we must build. But we have to work hard to defeat this prejudice yeah. in our uh, big decision makers all over the world, especially Europe and Latin American decision workers. I talk about them because I know them. Porto Alegre is, is a very active city in the worldwide networks of cities. Yeah. My mayor is a very important uh, player in this uh, decision maker uh, organizations. Yeah. So uh, I would uh, ask you, Michael, and from the Rockefeller Foundation, has a very 
active communication strategy toward these uh, big uh, worldwide organizations in order to show the way you are thinking and the way you are trying to, to, to make things in this new moment we are living in humanity. Yeah. Uh, I don't know how much I could say to, to help on that, but I feel we have to take into account that problem in order to find different strategies to deal with it. Okay, so thank you for that. I think both yours and Mike's, uh, and let's, we'll take, the, we've taken note of the um, communications challenges that are associated with being associated with Rockefeller that play differently in different parts of the world for sure. Some places were not known at all. Some places like Africa were beloved. Uh, some places there might be suspicion. So I appreciate all of those things. Um, but I, I would make a, 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 I see a link between what you and Mike were talking about, and that is there are certain large organizations that we should either choose to try to influence and partner with and really engage with or not. But there are a lot of these organizations. And UCLG and ICLE and you know, C40 and ISDR and Habitat itself and and, and, and. And so one of the things we're really, we are trying to do for 2016, and we will welcome your input as we continue to refine this, is to try to understand where we can be most impactful and where we should just let someone else. There's so much of this organization this agenda that we can spread all over the world. We have to pick one of, one of the, another one, um, uh, looking at Jeff, is going to be the US Conference of Mayors um, that Mitch Landrieu is leading in 2017. So where are the opportunities that are ripe for us to influence? And where are, is just too much to do? And we're trying, it's been one of the hardest things, I have to say, that I was not prepared for in the two years, trying to figure out where those opportunities are and aren't. And you know, I'm a sucker, so I say yes to almost everything. Fly down 12 hours to Porto Alegre to give a five minute speech and fly back, right? Because you, my Brazilian stepfather, asked me to do it, right? <laughs> but, but. So, but, but we'll engage you all as we, as we start to refine the methodology and the calculus for how we engage. And, and also, as we stand up uh, the European offices, and I saw Christiana somewhere, um, uh, the, the, the regional offices, we will also have better ability both to assess that, but also then to respond to that in a more localized, meaningful way. So we are, it's on top of our mind. I, I gave a whole speech about being on time, and we're just at time. But if there's one more, maybe? It's all from this side. This side is not. Brian, what are you doing to these people over here? <laughs> <laughs> Tony. Yeah, w one small remark about the refugees. Uh, it's true. Uh, uh, the refugees can be uh, uh, an advantage, uh, a liability, or an asset for a country. Mm -hmm. And uh, most of the countries in the Middle East, they're like, like Lebanon and Jordan and Turkey. They have the biggest uh, numbers. Uh, it's true that, uh, that they are uh, putting uh, stress on our infrastructure and they're changing the demographic. But there is a lot of advantages that uh, I would like if someone is interested in this subject to discuss it with him. We yeah. can define a lot of positive impact. Yeah. Uh, as you mentioned, when they are properly uh, uh, integrated in the, in, the, in the society. Yeah, I think that's right. I would love to be part of a w working learning community on, on, on that issue. I think that would be great. And just to give him another plug, Sebastian was a deputy mayor in a town, a suburb of Paris, that struggled with this, continues to struggle with this issue. It's where many of the migrants are pushed to because Paris has such a low density uh, policy. So the only place for them to go is in some of these suburban towns. Um, so I think we have lots of people from Amman, from Paris, from Biblos, who have, from many of our cities who have been thinking about this. Athens, yes. So with that, thank you very much. Have a great day. <clears throat>
PJ. PJ. PJ, I'd like to invite you up. Okay.